Welcome to Women in the Word. My name is Vanita Jones, and as always, it is my great pleasure to be here with all you women studying God's Word. It's my happy place on earth. I love seeing your faces. I love hearing the discussion around your tables. I just know it's deep and rich. I wish I could be at every single table. I hope you're enjoying this study of Romans as much as I am, and I have to admit it was a challenge, but not in the way I, think it's, I thought it was going to be a challenge. I thought it would be really difficult theologically and all that stuff, but more I've been challenged to take a deep look at my own life and do some evaluation on some areas in my life that I have power to overcome sins that seem to reoccur in my life. And I hope that you're being challenged in the same way as well. I'm sure by now you understand why some theologians consider this book to be second only to the Gospels in importance. And that's because every Christian found every Christian truth we know here is the foundation of everything we believe as a Christian. He, he records all of these right here in Romans. It's the entire foundation of our Christian life. Last week, Lynn led us through Romans 5, and this is where Paul records that we were once enemies to God, but now we've been reconciled to God. And it's all about the justification of the believer. And you remember that means that we're saved by the, from the penalty of sin, and that's through the work that Christ did on the cross to forgive our sins. And now we're no longer enemies of God. By the end of that chapter, Paul is not only described, or he's described God makes us righteous. He gives us his righteousness. But now he begins to tell us how he's going to reveal that righteousness that is in each one of us. In fact, the last two verses of chapter 5, Paul is giving a little teaser about what he's going to record in the chapter 6. Let's look at chapter 5, just the last two verses. It says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul had spent those last 19 verses in, that, in chapter 5 explaining justification to the Roman believers, and now he's going to start explaining what happens after justification. See, justification is that one-time event that occurs in every believer's life. And after the Lord has declared you righteous through that justification, sanctification begins. Sanctification is God's ongoing work of separating a believer from their sin and transforming their life toward holiness and purity, a life where you're going to look more and more and act more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. Now, it's a journey that doesn't happen quickly. It's a journey that, while we're still in this mortal body, is still going to be going on. It's only going to be completed when we pass away and we're standing in the presence of our Heavenly Father. That's when you'll be fully gone through your sanctification. And He doesn't just set us out on this journey. He doesn't just say, you know, uh, good luck and uh, text me when you get there. <laughs> it's like I do my kids every time they get on the road. He doesn't do that at all. He's so involved. He's very involved. He's completely involved in every minute, every second of our sanctification, which is a very individual thing for every believer. See, God created us, so he knows us so well. He knows our weaknesses, our strengths. He knows exactly what needs to be done to sanctify us. Now, for most of us in this room, after accepting Christ, we've had a whole lot of life to live. Some of you might have been eight. I heard this morning someone's grandchild was nine. He accepted Christ this morning. Sanctification can last years and years for some of us. Some of you, it may have been 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, a month, a week. It might have been yesterday, but I know it wasn't a deathbed confession. Because you're right here this morning. <laughs> you're still here. And you know, deathbed confessions do happen. Death, deathbed conversions happen. And, and their sanctification is a very short period of time. In fact, there's one very famous one, isn't there, that we all know about. It's recorded in the Bible. He was on the cross, the thief. His possibly the shortest deathbed conversion sanctification period you've ever heard of. But for most of us, sanctification happens over a long period of time. We all start in the same place. We'll all end up in the same place. But what that looks like in between is going to be very different from person to person. This reminds me of something that happened this last Christmas. It was shortly after Thanksgiving. I was at Lowe's, and 
I saw this display of amaryllis flowers. You know what I'm talking about? The Christmas flower. They're called the Christmas flower because they come with this promise that they're going to bloom by Christmas. Now, I'm, gonna not, I'm not going to lie to you. Amaryllis flowers are a source of stress for me. Like, the holidays are already stressful enough with all the stuff I have to accomplish. Now I have to depend on this plant to do its job, and I have no control over it. So I quit buying them years ago. But this year, they were a little bit different. They came with the bulb encased in this wax ball. And it looked like a Christmas ornament. They had to put a little glitter on it, and, and the little plant was popping out the top. And there were strict instructions, do not water this plant. It sounded like horrible logic to me. I love to water my plants. <laughs> but I fell for it. I didn't just buy one. I bought two two of those crazy Christmas flowers. So I get them home, and I put them in this cute little Christmas container, and I put them on the coffee table right in the middle of everything I do all day long, and I just started stressing over it. <laughs> Would I be able to use it for decorations? Would I have to buy something different? Well, when they started out, they looked very much alike. I made sure I wanted them to look kind of the same, but after just a few, after about a week, I realized I had an overachiever on my hands, and this is what it looked like. Look at him. It's like, yeah, I'm going to win this race. And then after a few weeks, knowing I had this overachiever, several weeks later, actually 10 days before Christmas, my overachiever came out with this. 10 days. 10 days before Christmas. Of course I'm stressed because what's going to happen to this guy? I'm going to only have one blooming. And guess what? I'm not kidding you, seven days later, three days before I needed him on my Christmas table for dinner, this is what happened. There they are. There they are, both blooming, both started at the same place, both ended at the same place, but the in-between looked very, very different for both of those. The same can be said about our sanctification. See, we all start in the same place. We're going to start in Christ, and we're going to end at the same place, and it's going to be in the presence of our Heavenly Father. But everything that happens in the middle is going to be very different from believer to believer. I want you to open up Romans chapter 6 and follow along as I read the first two verses of this chapter. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So these two questions posed in verse 1 are in direct response to what we just read in chapter 5 when we studied last week. Undoubtedly, Paul has been facing some poor logic in his travels across the Roman Empire. So he's using this opportunity to address this issue again, and it's the, the issue of poor logic about the doctrine of grace. Basically, what he's heard them saying is, if sin brings grace and more sin brings more grace then why don't we just keep sinning more so we get more grace? It's kind of like saying, if this much cookie dough makes this many cookies, and I make this much, I get this many cookies. Sounds like good logic. And they were following that logic. But to be honest, it sounds like how we rationalize our sins sometimes. And Paul is going to waste no time answering these two questions. In verse 2, he emphatically rejects the idea that God's grace was designed for us to, to sin. It was not designed to encourage us to sin at all. And he states the reason we should never even entertain that idea, is this thought, is because as a believer, we have died to sin. Now, notice he said you died to sin. He didn't say we die to sin or we're going to die to sin or we will die to sin. We died to sin. That past tense of the word died, it suggests that there was a one-time event that happened in every believer's life. And he's not saying in that one-time event that sin just became extinct. We know that's not true. So sin doesn't become extinct, but rather it no longer has the same power over us now that we've died to sin. And Paul being Paul, he's going to go on from there after he explains that, that we're not capable. We are capable of sinning. We just don't have to sin anymore. We have a changed relationship with our sin. And he goes on and in great detail in, in the way Paul does it. He lays down this foundation for all of us, and it's a foundation of our sanctification. Let's pick up in verse 3. I'm going to read to verse 11. Verse 11. 
Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in that in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So in verse 3, he was posed with those questions. He, he poses another question, actually, in verse 3. And it's another one that when you first read it, it's kind of confusing. He says, do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? It just kind of leaves us wondering, what is he talking about here? But I think Paul is saying that all who have placed their faith into Christ, they've been baptized into Christ. They've been placed into Christ. There's some confusion, and some have believed that this refers to the water baptism. But Paul is not speaking of a water baptism here. And we know that because that would suggest that we are saved by our water baptism. The New Testament consistently denies that we're saved by a water baptism. There's scripture all throughout, but look at Acts 16 on your verse sheet. This is when Paul and Silas are in prison, and there's been an earthquake. And the jailer, he says, called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. You and your household. And he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all in the house, in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and he washed their wounds and he was baptized and his whole family. All he had to do was believe. The baptism showed that he believed and had placed his, his in Christ. The baptism is, water baptism is a public declaration of an accomplished spiritual work that occurred in the believer's life. The word baptized used in, in uh, Romans 6, 3, it's a translation of a Greek word that means to be immersed or to be placed into something. Some places in the New Testament, you may actually see this as have, you have put on Christ or you've uh, been clothed with Christ. I, I kind of look at that as like when I used to take my kids, two of them would be fighting and I would be at my wits end and I would put them both in one dad's big t-shirts and they had to stay there until the timer went off. And they became friends really quickly because when one sat down, the other had to sit down. When the other stood up, the other had to stand up. When the one ate, the other one had to eat. They were together in everything they did. But see, they're, refer they're referring to that exact thing, being united with Christ, identifying with Christ. So the truth that Paul is stating here is that by faith, believers have placed, been placed into Christ and being placed into Christ means that we're united with him, or identify with him. And when we identify with him, that means we identify in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And in verse 4, Paul sheds light on how Christ was raised from the dead. He says that it was through the power of God. That's how Christ came back from the dead. He was raised by the power of God. And that verse ends with something I think is very encouraging. It should encourage all of us. It's... It says that so we might walk in newness of life. We also can walk in newness of life. See, becoming a Christian isn't just about doing something a little different. You don't accept Christ and things are just a little bit different. It's not, it's, it involves a completely brand spanking new identity. And that identity is in Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 on your verse sheet. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's not a new job. It's not like you start a new diet program or a new workout program. It's, it's not like you move to a new city. It's a completely new identity, one that is so united with him that when he died, we died with him. And that when he rose from the dead to new life, so did we. We. 
So did we. We are no longer slaves to sin, no longer slaves to sin that made us enemies of God. It doesn't rule over us. I'm no longer Vanita 1.0 with a couple of updates. Not at all. I am Vanita 2.0 with a brand new operating system. It's an operating system that's completely foreign to the one I had before. It's completely different. And Paul goes on to say in these next several verses, ending in verse 11, that our identity in Christ means that we must consider, we must count ourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ. He doesn't say, you know, you need to think about it. You, if you are or you might be, you are. You're dead to that sin. Look at Colossians 3 on your verse sheet. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are here on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I love how Romans 6, 11 pretty much encompasses the life of the believer. It reminds us of our past justification and it points us forward to our sanctification where we begin to look and act more and more like Christ. You know, I think we have a hard time with this because we have a hard time understanding how we can be credited with righteousness when we did nothing to deserve it. It wasn't by our own works. It wasn't by our own merit. It wasn't anything that we could offer or bring to the table. Nothing. And because of that, because of our human side, we think, oh, that really can't be true. So I think we all struggle with counting ourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ. You know, I have an illustration I think might clear it up. Now, it's a golf illustration. Before you start groaning, you don't have to understand golf to understand this, okay? But occasionally, I'm asked to play in a golf tournament. But it is always a tournament called a scramble. It's a certain time of golf tournament. Now, here's why I'm asked to be in a tournament that's a scramble. Because in every scramble tournament, every team has an A, B, C, and a D player, okay? The D player could also be called the worst player on the team. <laughs> and when I'm asked to be on a scramble, that player has a name. Her name's Vanita. <laughs> so I'm always the D player, and I'm okay with that. There's no expectation. I'm just there to have fun, right? So if that's the worst player, guess what the A player is? The best player. Yeah, and if you're as blessed as I am to have great golfers in my life, they're also called the ringer because they're really good at golf, okay? So this is how it works. The B and C player, they come in, you know, clutch. They're pretty good players. They're not great. They have good moments of, of golf. But this is how it works. We all get up to the tee box, the first tee box. All four of us are going to tee off. From that hole on to all the way through the entire course, you're going to be using the very best ball, which means it's the one closest to the hole. That's also always the A player's ball, okay? <laughs> and so that means wherever that A player put the ball, which is always way past mine on this fairway, I get to go down there and put my ball where their ball is. And so in every scramble, there are some very impressive scores. Very impressive scores because guess what? We're only playing the best ball all the way through the round. In fact, it's not uncommon to actually to win a, a golf scramble, and I've done this before with 15 under par. You don't have to know what that means. It, just, it means it's amazing. <laughs> In my entire life as a golfer, I've played since I was 23. I couldn't hope to be 15 under par. The pros hope to have 15 under par. Okay, that's how amazing that is. But in a scramble... I can be at 15 under par. That's because when that A player made a great shot, so did I. Yeah, we like to call it when they shot it, we got it. Yeah, <laughs> that's my ball. I didn't even, I'm over there in three fairways away, but that's my ball. <laughs> Their score is credit to me because I'm on that team in, in a much, much more important way than the golf scramble we receive the benefits of Christ. We re receive the benefit of being on his team, being in him. He won that ultimate battle against death, and his victory is ours as a believer. Never in our entire lives could we hope or even pray that we could overcome the battle that Christ won against death. But because our faith is in him, 
and we've been placed into Christ, his victory now is our victory. That's how it works. See, the temptations and the sins that previously seemed to consume us and they ruled our lives and made it impossible for us to resist, now we have identity in Christ. That's who we are. We have died to sin, been raised to a new life. It no longer has the same power over us. So let your identity in Christ encourage you. It should spur you on to complete obedience, courageous obedience in God. See, obeying God God isn't always the easiest path, or it doesn't seem like the easiest path, does it? Sometimes it seems really hard to obey God. But you have the power to live a life of courageous obedience to God, even when that obedience doesn't sound isn't accepted by everybody around you. It sounds counter to what the world is telling you. You can still follow what he's leading you to do. Let's continue. I'm going to pick up in verse 12, and I'm going to read the next three verses. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instructions for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now, these next three verses, he kind of drives home the truth of the believer's sanctification, or in these last verses. And now in these three, he's basically laying an outline of what he's going to kind of record in the last part of chapter 6. Um, he lays his foundation saying that with instructions how to live that, how are we going to do that? Now that we've countered ourselves. What does that look like as we take our next step? What does that look like when the rubber meets the road? And he gives us these instructions for living a new life, dead to sin and alive in Christ. And first he does it, he says, don't let sin reign in your body. Just don't let it get started. If you know that this is a a temptation for you, don't go there. Walk away from that. He says, we can't only know the sin is no longer ruling over us. We can't just have that knowledge. You have to act on that knowledge. You have to act on that truth that you've learned. The action is not simply making peace with your sin. It's not you just you saying, well, that's my personality or that's how God made me, and so this is one I'll always fight with. No. You battle it. You go to war with that sin. You fight against it. Don't let it reign in your body. Secondly, choose to serve God rather than sin. We have a choice every minute of the day. Who are we going to serve? Are you going to let that sin rule you and that's who you serve? Or are you going to choose to use that time in your day to serve God? He'll give you opportunities at every turn to serve him. How do we do that? He tells us it's as those who were brought back from death to life. We have that power. He reminds us that we share in Christ's resurrected life, and because we're so united with him, we have that power to live this life different, different than the way we did before we were in Christ. He says we have two choices, basically. And, and look at Joshua 24, 15 on your verse sheet. This is Joshua saying basically the same thing. He's on his deathbed. He's speaking to the Israelite leaders, and he says to them, And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in those lands you dwell. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You got to make that choice. Choose to serve sin or choose to serve God. What is it going to be? Thirdly, he says, allow God's grace to lead you to obedience. You know, we don't live under the Old Testament law anymore. We live under grace. The reality of truth of that in itself should spur us on to obedience. God's grace is such an amazing gift for us. It should spur us on to live a life of obedience to God. You know, grace should be the lens through which we view everything. It should be how we view ourselves, how we view our church, everyone around us, our relationship with our Heavenly Father, other people, other relationships. It's our filter. It's, it's, it governs everything we see, how we interact. It should be the very reason we live the way we live. God's grace. Let's pick up in verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. 
not under the law, by no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to one, anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, become obedient from the heart, the standard of teaching to which you committed. And having been set free from sin and having become slaves of righteousness, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural real limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get, to, you get leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have this choice to step out in this, this freedom that we've been given when we declared righteous by God, but that is a very daunting place for us to go. It's a brand new, unfamiliar place. And, and theologians call that place uh, this internal transformation. It's where they t we go from a newly freed slave of sin into a mature, free individual. It's our sanctification. It doesn't come natural or easy to any of us. And because of that, it's a process that we have to accomplish not on our own power, but on the power of God. You know, Paul states that, starts out in verse 15, that with there are more questions that are in direct response to the previous questions. Obviously, he feels like the, the doctrine of grace is still not completely understood. And he just tells him it's not a license to sin. That's not what it is. He said it's terrible logic. Don't even think that way. It seems that there were believers in Rome that were still believing this. But see, grace not only justifies us, grace transforms us as well. It doesn't leave us right there. It transforms us. It gives us new desires. It gives us a new heart. It gives us a new mind. So Paul, so to Paul, the very idea that, that a, a staying in sin in the name of grace was completely foreign. And guess what? It should be to us too. It should be to us as well. It reminds me of when one of my kids would do something out of, completely out of character. I mean, it would be out of the four, it would be something that the one that would never do this would do something the other one would do. And you're like, wait a minute. That's totally out of character. Why would you do that? You know better than that. It's the same. Paul is, he's, he's writing, I don't understand why you'd even want to stay in that place. And in previous writings, he's addressed the truth that grace frees the believer from the cruel master of sin. But although we're freed from that, we still live in this world where we can be ruled by sin. It's, it's a world we can be tempted day by day that we can give into. And Paul goes on to say, you have a choice. You can either give in to those temptations and those desires, and you can become a slave to that sin. But that leads to death. Or you can be a slave to obedience, and that, that's through the power of God, and it brings you abundant life. Why in the world do we choose to serve a master whose sole purpose is to keep us enslaved and try to kill us? It makes no sense to me. But when Paul gets to verse 15, 17, maybe it's just due to he's reminded of, of the gift of grace. He breaks into this spontaneous praise. And I think he's just so taken by grace. I think we should be in spontaneous praise every time we think about grace. I think we take grace for granted. We hear it so much in our Bible study, in church, and, and, and just in our friends' groups. And it just flies right by us. The mere thought of grace should send us into spontaneous praise. Look at Ephesians 2, 4. Paul, um, in his letter to the Ephesians, he, he goes into how important and how amazing grace really is. He says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not by your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that nobody can boast. See, Paul realized the importance of grace. And he did not want it to be taken for granted. Grace is saying, you are not going to put grace in the corner. This is important, and we need to remember it. And the verses that follow remind us that grace is not just something we take for granted because everything he mentions in these verses, 17 through 23, is because of God's amazing grace. He says a sinner is offered forgiveness and freedom from slavery of sin because of God's grace. The believer is given a new heart, a new mind, and desires that are, they desire righteousness because of God's grace. The believer finds purpose and bears good fruit through obedience because of God's grace. The believer is assured of eternal life in Christ Jesus because of God's grace. The believer's entire life is because of God's grace. I mean, there's a reason we call it amazing grace. It's because it is. You know, John Newton wrote this in 1772. He said these words about grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. I never thought about when I sing that song. He's talking about grace in the beginning that brought me to my justification and, and no longer an enemy of God. He's talking about grace that leads me through the sanctification and all that I'm going to go through until I'm standing at the foot of Jesus, which is also because of amazing grace. It's a beautiful picture. Grace at the beginning, grace at the end, and grace in everything in them between. Now, the word sanctification only appears in chapter 6 twice. We see it in 19 and 22. But it's obvious, obviously a central theme here. And it's going to be a theme for the next couple of chapters. Paul has made it abundantly clear in Romans 6 that the believer has a choice to make. And Jesus says the same thing, basically, in Matthew 6, 24. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and he'll despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. In there you could put, you cannot serve God in whatever it is, whatever it is that you choose to serve other than him. And in verses 20 and 21, Paul addresses the fact that God has created us with needs, okay? We're all created to need, and those needs are, were meant to bring us back, to bring us to him, to bring us in dependence with him. And many times we feel like he's just not meeting the needs in the way I deserve to be met. Or I think I can do this on my own and meet these needs. And we often turn to other things other than what God, other than God to fill those voids. You know, I've heard, him call, I've heard it called a God-shaped hole. You may have heard that. It's a God-shaped hole that he places in us, and, and we try to fill it with anything else other than God is going to lead us to pain and discomfort. It's like pounding a, a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't fit. And Paul goes on, and he asks the last rhetorical question in chapter 6 that he's going to ask. And in effect, he's saying, so when you're trying to meet those needs that God, those God-given needs, when you were pursuing sin to do that, how'd that work out for you? What kind, of, what kind of fruit were you producing at that time? Sin is usually the result of someone trying to fill a legitimate, legitimate God-given need with an illegitimate way. The things the world officer, offers us, it's, it's to fill those God-given needs, they're going to they're gonna give us immediate gratification, almost always. They know they can hook you in there. And, and it's going to give you some great satisfaction until it doesn't. I've always said, you, you go outside of God's will to get something you really want or need, you're going to have to stay out there to keep it. And it's not a great place to go or stay. Paul reminds believers that though we're free from the bondage of sin, we were created with God-given needs and we were given the choice of how to fill those needs. And we're always going to look for ways to fill them. Always. That's why he calls them needs. 
It's stuff we feel like we have to have. And what we choose to fill them with is what we're going to serve. Remember, Jesus said that we can't serve two masters. So it's important that we choose wisely when we we feel that God-shaped hole in our bodies that was created by him. While in sin... While sin may seem appealing, and it may appear that it's going to give you that freedom that you've just so desired, it's going to give you that satisfaction. The truth is, increasing your independence on God provides even more complete, meaningful satisfaction. And ironically, until you've actually walked there and done this, you find more freedom. It's hard to explain, but you find more freedom when you're obedient to him. Paul concludes chapter 6 with a very familiar verse. It's one that many of you, I'm sure, can can recite to me because I've heard you say it before. Me, I always paraphrase it because that's how I memorize. I'm not a good person at memorizing, a terrible memorizer. But he states it very clearly. The wages of sin are death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now, this verse is the definition of the word grace to me. It's often used to explain the gospel, but I think it also can explain and be very encouraging to believers in their sanctification as well. The phrase, in Christ, that we see throughout this chapter, it's, also, it's actually used frequently by Paul. And I think that's interesting. He doesn't call them the believers, the Christians. He calls them those in Christ more often. In fact, he uses that phrase 84 different times in his letters throughout the New Testament. And then this one in Romans, he uses it 13 different times. The first time he introduces it is in verse, or chapter 3. And here in chapter 6, the phrase in Christ becomes the very key to understanding everything that our Christian faith is built on. It, it explains our sanctification, it explains everything about how we were justified. As believers, every aspect of our life comes from being alive in Christ. It's our purpose, it's our joy, it's our rest, it's our hope, our security. And I can tell you, if I asked every woman in here, I could add another word to that list. If you are in Christ, you have decisions to make each and every day. And as a Christian, let your words and your actions reveal that you are dead to sin and alive in Christ. Allow your actions to reveal that righteousness that that is being declared to you back when you were justified in Christ. Are you going to choose slavery to sin? Or are you going to choose slavery to righteousness? We're all going to serve something, so choose wisely. Please pray with me. Father, we love your word, and we love how it fills us. But even more importantly, I love how it challenges us, Lord. Lord, I pray that no woman leaves here the same, that each one of us takes a piece of this truth and just embeds it into our heart. And as we apply it to our lives, you just teach us about who we are and who we can be in you. We love you. We love your word. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen.